open up Psalm 88 here. Uh, Father, we thank you for, for this day and this time to gather, not as an escape from reality, but as a reminder of reality. On the one hand, a, a reminder that we are living life in a fallen world, but then also a reminder of the reality of the faithfulness of your son to us. And so, so as we look into Psalm 88, we pray that we would see your faithfulness to us, even in this psalm that seems hopeless. And I pray that as a result of what we see here, you would give us hope. You would give us trust in Jesus, that you would make us more and more like Jesus. You'd make us people with the heart of Jesus uh, because of what we see here this morning. And we're dependent on your spirit to do this. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, last week, Cody walked us through what is probably the most warm and comforting of all the Psalms in Psalm 23. And today, I get to walk us through what is probably the darkest of all the Psalms in, in Psalm 88. And this Psalm, which we'll read in a second, can seem almost out of place in our Christian faith because it actually represents an important dimension of the Christian spiritual life that we almost completely ignore and neglect in our day to our hurt. Now remember that, that the Psalms are songs or prayers, and many of us have learned to pray according to the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, and, and it's a good and it's a helpful acronym where we first, A, we adore God, and then C, we confess our sins to God, and then T, we give thanks, thanksgiving to God, and then S is supplication where we ask for things, and those are all good and biblical categories of prayer, and they, they line up pretty well with the categories of prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but as Pastor Abraham Cho points out, that acronym, even though it's really good and helpful, leaves out what is probably the most common type of prayer in all of the Bible. And that's the type of prayer that we read in Psalm 88, a prayer of lament. We almost never pray like this at all. But there's a ton of this in the Bible, including an entire book of lamentations. And, and here's how I think how not having these prayers in our lives has hurt us. Uh, in our day, there's a, a very public move, movement of, of deconstruction where people are walking away from the faith, and they have a lot of different reasons for that. Sometimes they say they're walking away because they were harmed by churches. Uh, sometimes it's because Christianity doesn't seem to fit the moral values of the culture around them, and they chose the culture. Uh, sometimes they just desire to live a, white, a life that is contrary to the Christian way of life. Sometimes it's because of real intellectual objections. But another major reason that people live the, leave the faith is that the Christian experience that they had didn't seem to match the impression that was given to them up front. That it wasn't what they expected. And their faith lacked the pressure relief valve that was designed to handle that, which is these prayers of lament. Uh, back when we were planning the church, I earned a chunk of my income as a home inspector. And, and one common thing that we would look for when we went into people's houses to decide if they should buy the house was we'd go and look at the hot water tank in the basement and we would look to see if the, the little valve that's on the side of that tank had been capped or anything. If the little valve that drips sometimes, some people, times people see it's dripping, so they screw a cap on it. But, but that valve is the, the pressure relief valve. And so if you cap that thing off, pressure can build up in the hot water heaters. And we even had like the, the stories of legend that home inspectors would tell people, like that, that people have capped off those valves and then the pressure builds up and then those things blow the bottom out and shoot, they've shot through the roofs of houses. And I don't know if that ever actually happened. It would be awesome to see, but it was just, you, you had to have that pressure relief valve so, so that the thing didn't destroy everything. And in, in our faith, the type of prayer that we're going to look at today, this, this prayer of lament, is the type that we're supposed to pray when the pressure is high. When things go badly, when hope is low, when life isn't making any sense, this is how we go to the Lord with these things to release that pressure. Sometimes I think we try to spin Christianity as the answer for all of our problems. But the Bible doesn't spin it that way. And then sometimes in our lives, when our experience as Christians is hard and dark, we, we look at it and we say, well, why doesn't this line up with what everybody told me Christianity is like? But the Bible actually tells us what it's like. If you're a, a student of fine culture like me, you may have seen the Lego movie. And... <laughs> At the beginning of that movie, there's this character, Ernest, who's voiced by Chris Pratt, and he's a worker at a factory where the theme song is Everything is Awesome. And everybody works day at, every day at their job. They kind of tamp down all the problems they have with their job and their lives. And they sing, everything's awesome. Everything's cool when you're part of a team. Everything's better when we stick together, side by side. You and I, we're going to win forever. Let's party forever. We're the same. I'm like you. You're like me. We're working in harmony. 
And I think often in church, we can present this everything is awesome image for the Christian faith. And when we experience long-term not awesome, we can only pretend so long before we just kind of explode. Like that pressure is going to go somewhere. But prayers of lament, like Psalm 88, were put in the Bible by God to teach us what to do with our complaint and with our losses, with our frustration and with our grief and with the times in life when God seems silent and when it seems like he's not answering our prayers. For the times in life where everything is not awesome and it doesn't feel like we're winning forever and we don't feel like we are those other people who think that everything is awesome all the time in this walk with God. And so we'll read through this psalm where there is no direct hope offered at all. But the fact that God inspired this psalm is hopeful because it shows us what to do in those times of real difficulty. So, so let's read this, this psalm from the beginning. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah to the choir master, according to Mahalath Lianoth, a mascal of Heman the Ezraite. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. Selah. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I'm shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in a land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I'm helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You've caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. And that's where it ends. I'm really not sure what circumstances gave rise to this song, but just kind of scanning through these lines, we know that whoever's singing it is in huge trouble. He thinks that he's going to die. Uh, Verse 3, he says that he's going down to Sheol, which was the abode of the dead. In verse 8, it says that he's lost his friends. Verse 18 says his companions have become darkness, which could literally be translated, darkness is my only companion. So he's looking at his life and he says, you want to know who stays right by my side my entire life? Darkness, and that's it. Everybody else took off. And then in this complaint that he's pouring out to God, there's this deep cynicism and sarcasm. Look at verse 10 again. He says, do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love going to be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? It's like you're saying, yeah, God, you work wonders for your people. I've always heard about it. But if I'm dead, what wonders are you going to be working for me? God, you delight in the praise of your people. But if I'm in the grave, what praise are you going to get from me there? Am I going to die and and then tell everybody how good you've been to me? And you look for God in this psalm, and and at best, he seems to be hiding. Verse 14, he says, why do you hide your face from me? It's like he's seeking God, and God's not there. God seems far. God seems silent. But then more than that, he's looking at God like God is actively against him. All throughout this psalm, he describes God as the active agent in causing his problems. Verse 6, he says, you have put me in the depths of the pit. Verse 7, you overwhelm me with your waves. Verse 8, you've caused my companions to shun me. You cast my soul away, in verse 14. I suffer your terrors, in verse 15. So he's not just praying to God about his problems, he's blaming God for his problems. 
If God is sovereign and ruling over all things, then certainly he has a hand in causing all these things that are going on in my life. In verse 15, he says, it's been going on from my youth up. It's like he's saying, God, you have never been there for me. You read this, and you almost feel like you would get struck by lightning if you prayed this way. Like if you're sitting in a prayer meeting in a circle with a group of people and someone starts praying like this, you scoot your chair away a little bit like to, to provide that buffer and, and some safety. But this is how he's praying. And what's crazy is this is how someone's praying who has a relationship with God and who also prays constantly. In verse 1, he says, O Lord, God of my salvation. And he calls him Lord Yahweh. This is the name that God gave his people to call him by. So he's saying, God, I'm one of your people. You've saved me. You're the God of my salvation. And he says that he's always praying. Verse 1, he says he prays day and night. Verse 9, he says he prays every day. His prayer is not lacking passion. He's crying out in prayer in verses 9 and 13. So he's one of God's people. He's saved by God. He's faithful in his prayer. And his life is darkness. So why does God tell us this? Why is this psalm here? Well, for one, it tells us that darkness like this can come into the life of a real Christian and can stay there for a while. Now, in everything is awesome Christianity, there's no category for things like this. We go through darkness like this and we think either I'm not a Christian or, or God must not be real or I must somehow have sinned and done something wrong or maybe I'm not praying enough because we tend to believe that times of darkness like this can't enter into a faithful Christian's life unless we've done something. And then when we continually hear Christianity presented as the foolproof way to ensure that there won't be times like this, it really unnerves us when we go through those. And when so much of our Christianity is sweeping under the rug all the people whose lives have fallen apart while Christians, not telling the stories of the people whose kids don't thrive or who have troubles in their marriages, we don't mention often that there are times when God feels far and silent we don't talk about the fact that we don't understand why God seems to be allowing troubles in our lives. But these prayers of lament show us that even though God is real, even though you really are a Christian, even though you've done nothing more wrong than anybody else, there are times like this. There are times when God doesn't make sense, when prayers seem to go unanswered, when God seems to be hiding like he's silent and distant and you just wonder if he's against you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you've done something wrong. In fact, if you go back through history and read the stories of great Christians and those who left journals of their experiences, those that we would consider some of the most fruitful and amazing Christians in history often write about times of deep darkness. Uh, Adoniram Judson, who was the first to bring the gospel to the nation of Burma in the 1800s, which in hindsight was very fruitful. There are about 3,700 churches there today, a lot of flourishing Christianity there. But when he went there, there were no Christians. The conditions were terrible. People were against him. The climate was terrible. His first wife and his second wife died on that field. A number of his children died. He was imprisoned. He was isolated. And in his duress in prison, he wrote, God is to me the great unknown. I believe in him, but I find him not. And story after story of great Christians come forward and they, and they just show that we have times like this. Great Christians talk like this, and not only great Christians, Jesus himself told us in Matthew 10, 24, a disciple's not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So if Jesus suffered innocently, then we can expect, because we're not above our master, that there will be times when we suffer innocently too. And so here's just a little bit of hope in this hopeless psalm. God put this here to tell us that this happens. So if you today are in a time of darkness, even a prolonged one, let this alleviate all the extra suffering that comes from the false guilt that keeps telling you that real Christians don't go through this stuff. Don't feel like you have to wash yourself in that false guilt where, where you keep telling yourself, I must have done something to deserve this. I wish I knew what it was. This must be a result of that sin I committed 15 years ago and have long since repented of. Like, like this is finally that thing catching up to me. Or if I was just a better Christian, this wouldn't be happening to me. 
the presence of this psalm should alleviate that guilt. Without doing anything more wrong than anybody else, we go through these times where it's the silence of God. Andrew Peterson uh, wrote these lyrics in his song called The Silence of God. He said, it's enough to drive a man crazy. It'll break a man's faith. It's enough to make him wonder if he's ever been sane. When he's bleating for comfort from your staff and your rod, and the heaven's only answer is the silence of God. It'll shake a man's timbers when he loses his heart, when he has to remember what broke him apart. This yoke may be easy, but this burden is not when the crying fields are frozen by the silence of God. And if a man has got to listen to the voices of the mob who are reeling in the throes of all the happiness they've got, when they tell you all their troubles have been nailed up to that cross, then what about the times when even followers get lost? And most Christians who've walked with God for a long time, if they're honest, will tell you that part of their journey has been journeying through darkness. And many, if they're honest, will say, I'm there now. And lament is one of the resources that God's given us to persevere through times like that. Because there's a super strong witness to the truth of the gospel that comes from a Christian that perseveres in faithfulness to Jesus and his gospel even through those times of darkness. In C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, the, the premise is that a senior demon is writing to his nephew Wormwood and he's coaching him on how to oppose God, the enemy. And he says, don't be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asked why he has been forsaken and still obeys. So there's power in, in perseverance through those dark times. And this lament here reminds us that not everything gets fixed for the faithful in this lifetime. And again, sometimes we present the Christian faith as the solution for this. Like, we'll, we'll have this psalm and we'll say, well, the moral of this story is that if you just believe harder, then you'll come out of the darkness. If you just knew the right theology, then your suffering would end. And there are certainly times where we go through things in life and God is working on teaching us something. And it seems like, all right, I learned the lesson and then he lifts the suffering. That happens sometimes. But there are other times like this where it just seems like the darkness is not lifting. So God puts this in the psalm so that we know that this happens sometimes. He also puts it here as an invitation to pray like this. It feels almost wrong to think thoughts like this about God. And, and sometimes when we pray like this, our thoughts will be wrong. They will be exaggerated. They may even contain sin. But by putting this prayer in the Bible, God's saying, just cast your heart, cast it all on me. In Jesus, he has showed us that he's a God who, out of love for us, will take all the garbage that we throw at him. And no, he doesn't deserve it, but he says to pray it to him anyway. He didn't deserve the nails that were put through his hands on the cross, but he's a God who comes to take that stuff from us. And so in this passage here, he's saying, just pour it out on me. And if you find out that in your words there's something that he needs to forgive, you confess your sins, and he's a faithful God who abundantly pardons. And he gave us these words so that we have some language for the things that we're feeling. He's a God who loves to help us pray. Romans 8.23 says, in the same way, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. There are times even when all we've got is a groan, and the Spirit takes that and presents that before the Father as the prayer that we needed to pray. So we can pray and pray honestly, knowing that God knows that we don't know how to pray well, knowing that the Spirit will help us, and that sometimes if it's just a wordless groan in prayer, we're invited to pray it. So God put this here so that we would know that there are times like this. He put this here to invite us to pray like this when we're going through those times. And also because this psalmist is coming to God when he feels like this, we're shown that we don't have to clean ourselves up first before we come to God. God doesn't say here, like, okay, you got these crazy thoughts about me, so straighten those out, and then once you get those straightened out, then you can come to me. No, he says, cry to me when you're totally undone. Cry to me in your sin and in your misery. Cry to me when you don't think I'm hearing. 
Cry to me when your whole life, it seems like I've never been there for you. Cry to me when you think I'm the one making everything go wrong in your life. Don't wait to clean yourself up. Cry to me when you're still sarcastic and cynical and bitter and just so frustrated with how the Christian life is going. Don't wait to be okay first. When you're brokenhearted, know that God is near the brokenhearted even when you don't feel that. When you're broken and contrite, know that God doesn't despise a broken and contrite heart. When you feel like you're weak, like a bruised reed, or your faith feels like it's about to be extinguished, like a smoldering candle, Isaiah says, a a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. So this guy's a wreck, and he's, he's bringing his wreck to God, who doesn't seem to be listening. And by inspiring this psalm, God says, do it like that guy. He doesn't put an asterisk on here and say, like, this is how crazy people pray. Like, don't do any of this. This is a bad example. Like, there, there aren't brackets around this psalm. It's in there as one of the prayers that we pray, one of the songs that we sing. And this is a gracious invitation from a loving father. He's the father in the story of the prodigal son who says, you can always come home. Come home when you're a mess. Come home when you've spent it on crazy living. Come home when you're empty and hungry. Come home when you've got nothing to offer. Come home when you need to be forgiven. Don't wait until the darkness lifts. Come to me with all the darkness that's in you and around you. Bring it all. Come to me. Also, by putting the psalm in in the Bible, God put it there to give us sympathy for suffering people. Sometimes we go through a crisis and, and we convince, or we see someone going through a crisis and we convince ourselves, well, they must have done something to deserve that. Especially if, if it's a big crisis. Like little things, we can say, yeah, there may not be an explanation for that. We can kind of explain away the fender benders. But if somebody has like huge calamity come into their lives, we look for a huge cause. We just have this idea. They must have done something somewhere to allow that to happen. God wouldn't allow that to happen in the life of an innocent person. But this psalm keeps us from thinking like that. And if we know that people can suffer when they haven't done anything more wrong than anyone else, it keeps us from being like Job's friends who blamed Job when he was suffering. These lamentations just show us that some people have it very hard and they don't need our blame or correction. I mean, sometimes that's warranted, but we shouldn't assume it is. I know there have been times where sometimes I can get like very woe is me and my thinking unnecessarily and I've had good friends who've told me like knock it off. Like stop it. Stop thinking that way. And I've needed that correction. We need that sometimes. But then there are other times where things are just bad and hard and we need a friend to sit with us and be a friend. And to be that kind of friend we need to know that not all suffering was caused by the person who's suffering and not all of it can be fixed by our words, by our presence, or by them getting something right in their life. Not everything gets fixed by believing harder and doing better. Sometimes that's not the fix. Our family went through a major crisis a few years back, and it wasn't the kind of thing that anybody could fix. You don't fix that kind of thing. And and a few of our friends knew what was happening, and they were so consistently kind with notes and meals and check-ins and care and just being there. And of course, they couldn't fix anything, and they didn't try. But again and again, they were present. And we were able to tell our kids, this is what the Christian church is like. Look how good the church is to us. They're growing up in a world that that hates the church, that exaggerates its faults, and even though we have real faults. But even though our church couldn't fix the problem and there was nothing anyone could do to fix it, their being kind and near may have been the thing that built the right memories in the hearts of our kids as we walked through that tragedy. And to really love the suffering like so many of you already do, we need to hear these words of a suffering person so that we don't rush to accusation and fixing, but we just rush to presence and care. But so far, there's been one major piece of information about this psalm that I've been leaving out that really helps us get the meaning of this psalm. That if if the meaning of this psalm is really going to explode in our lives and do its intended work of ministering to us, we need to know this thing. I recently heard a comedian talk about his hippie friend who was also a comedian, and in the evening she would go out to play the comedy clubs, and one of her opening bits was that she would get up on the stage with her guitar and she would announce, 
tonight I'm going to sing a song for you, and it's a song that I wrote for the whales. And she would spend a lot of time like tuning her guitar and then kind of build up the anticipation by strumming it and, and really like building up the, the passion in the room. And then she would lean into the microphone and just make whale noises. Just, <laughs> and, and do that for a minute until everybody in the crowd was laughing. And, and one night she went to, to a comedy club. She did the whole setup. She got her guitar, tuned it, did the, the passionate strumming, leaned into the microphone, started making the whale noises, and nobody laughed. Like nothing from the whole crowd. And, and she's like a minute into these noises, and nobody's laughing at all. And then finally it occurs to her, I forgot to tell them this is a song for the whales. <laughs> so... <laughs> So nobody gets it. And without that piece of information, that's not a funny joke. It's just crazy person on a microphone. And so th there's a key piece of information that we need to know to make sense of all the Psalms. That if we're really going to get what these Psalms are about, if they're really going to do their work in our hearts, we need this one key piece of information. And that's that these are the prayers of Jesus. Now, all the scriptures are about Jesus, and if we ask, where is Jesus in the Psalms, one of the places is he's, one, he's the one who's praying these things. And this particular psalm has no direct note of hope, but Jesus is the hope of this psalm. In fact, if you read these words as the words of Jesus, they come out different. It really strips the, the sarcasm and the cynicism from this psalm. In fact, look at verse 10 again. The words of Jesus, do you work wonders for the dead? Yes. And Jesus, he did. Do the departed rise up and praise you? On the third day. Is your steadfast love declared in the grave? We've been celebrating the steadfast love that was declared in the grave of Jesus for 2,000 years. Are your wonders known in the darkness? Matthew 27, verse 45, Jesus is hanging on the cross and it says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the greatest wonder, known in the darkness. That God would send his son to, to embrace Psalm 88 suffering and to do it for us. So that no faithful person's suffering will last forever. Jesus is the ultimate answer to the lament of this psalm. The ultimate answer is not that I prayed this way and my circumstances got fixed. It's not even that I prayed this way and all of a sudden I understood everything God was doing in my life. It's not that everything got better in this lifetime. The ultimate answer is that Jesus rose from the grave. Death and darkness did not have the final word because God does work wonders for the dead. And because God did, all of the followers of Jesus can have confidence that he'll work wonders in our death too. So in your despair and in your darkness, you'll never go wrong in clinging to Jesus. And when you pour these things out on Jesus, you can know that he fully understands your suffering because he suffered it too. He suffered the darkness on the cross as the Father forsook him. He suffered those hours of the silence of God. His friends forsook him and he suffered alone. He suffered the, ra the waves of God's wrath pouring over him. And out of love for you, he did that for you. And because he did that, you can know when you pray that he totally understands. He really knows by experience what you're going through. Peterson's song goes on, there's a statue of Jesus on a monastery knoll in the hills of Kentucky, all quiet and cold. And he's kneeling in the garden, as silent as a stone. All his friends are sleeping and he's weeping all alone. And the man of all sorrows, he never forgot what sorrow is carried by the hearts that he bought. He knows your sorrow and your pain. He knows the darkness because he's been through it. He's prayed this too. And he embraced that suffering for you. So run back to him. Run back to him. Run with your sorrow and your lament and your pain. 
of all those who come to him, he won't lose one. He promised that. He was forsaken by God so you would not have to be eternally. He endured the deepest darkness so that you could know that one day your darkness will lift in the presence of God. The pain that you're going through is real, it's searing, but if you're his, one day you'll rise up up from your grave and you'll praise him. So let's pray. Well, Father, it is a huge kindness that you inspired these words for us. Again, your grace and mercy is evident as you invite us to pray this to you when we don't even deserve to be in your presence. And your love is evident as you sent your son to feel this and to pray this more truly than anyone ever has. So, Father, forgive us for for failing to bring our lament to you. Forgive us for tamping it down and pretending it's not there. Forgive us for praying to everyone else about our problems and allowing bitterness against you to grow in us. Forgive us. And Jesus, we thank you for experiencing this darkness and staying faithful. For faithfully praying, faithfully lamenting, faithfully dying, faithfully rising. You did all of this well. And you did it for us. You had faithless friends that forsook you. But you've remained a friend to us. And now in the gospel, you've counted your faithfulness as ours. So Spirit, help us to believe this. Help us to believe in the love that we have from Jesus that we see on the cross so that we run even with our lament to the Father. And especially in the hopeless times, remind us of our gospel hope. A hope that doesn't solve the problems now or fix every circumstance now, but a hope that comes from remembering what's true about your love for us and the future we have with you. Help us to remember the darkness you endured so that we could know this light of your presence. We pray these things in Jesus' name.